to the book of Exodus. We have been taking a survey of the great theological themes of the second book of Moses. As I've indicated that I do believe that in one way or another most of the essential gospel themes that we are going to have developed throughout the scripture have their foundation uh, in the book of Exodus. It is a most important book uh, than concerning the whole doctrine and issue of God's saving of his people. It's pictured for us, this great act of salvation is pictured for us here uh, in the deliverance of the nation of Israel from the place of bondage. And what we see taking place in terms of the nation uh, is a picture prophecy. It is an illustration, if you will, of what it is that God does in the salvation of every individual sinner. So there are uh, important lessons here, not only from a national perspective, uh, as it relates to the exodus of a nation, the birth of a nation, but also as it relates uh, then to the individual uh, grace that God manifests to his people in saving their souls. Now, in our survey of the book, we are looking at some very broad uh, questions. We started last time looking at the means by which God delivered uh, the people from the land of bondage. So that's where I want to pick it up today. How is it that God delivered Israel from this iron furnace of affliction? And there's two great emphases. Uh, that we're going to see here. Uh, number one, that God delivered them by his power. And number two, that God delivered them by the blood. Good to see Mrs. Abrams here, I thought, after our little discussion with Amenhotep II and Tutmos III last week that she had, she had just left for good. But uh, nothing to separate over. All right, nothing to separate over. Uh, be it Amenhotep II or Tutmos III, uh, God delivered the people from this iron furnace of affliction. It's just so much more neat when you see it as Tutmos the third. There you go. All right. Liberal. liberal? No, it's not liberal. It's just staying abreast of scholarship. That's what it is. All right. Uh, so what? What is the name? Who cares? And they're back there. Who cares? What are they talking about? Who cares? Uh, that's all right. So you have to have a very low threshold of interest uh, to be concerned with what we're concerned about here. Pottery is next, Pottery is next right? Remember, what, what's the great joke? Pots are not calendars. That just cracks me up. But uh, whatever. All right. How did God deliver? And you're just sitting there. You don't have a clue as to what's going on in my mind right now. Not a, not a one of you. That's okay. I don't need it. Uh, how did God deliver? All right. By his power and by his blood. And last week we looked particularly at some of the statements whereby the Lord's right hand or the Lord's arm uh, is revealed in the deliverance of the people. A great anthropomorphic expression uh, that describes the immense, the immense power uh, that was required in delivering these people from the land of bondage. Now the next thing that I want to address here the great emphasis that Exodus makes upon the use of signs and wonders as an evidence of the power of God. God's power evidenced in miracles. And there are two terms uh, that describe the miraculous supernatural intervention uh, that God let loose, if you will, in the delivering of these people from Egypt. The word sign and the word wonder. Uh, two important uh, terms here. Now let me just, before we look at some of the specific evidence, address this whole notion of the miraculous and of the supernatural. I think we have the impression sometimes, and it's easy to get the impression sometimes as we read the scriptures, uh, that the supernatural, the occurrence of miracles, were almost commonplace uh, in that ancient world. And really, it seems, I think, in much of our thinking, uh, that miracles were something that God was always doing until all of a sudden we have uh, the day in which we live, and it's something that never takes place. Uh, well, we want to be careful here. The miraculous 
was not something that happened on a constant, regular basis. When you read your scripture, uh, you'll find that there are basically four distinct periods in the history of the world uh, in which there is a focus of the supernatural, a focus on the miracles. And even in the Old Testament dispensation, in the New Testament era, uh, the miraculous were something that was very odd and something that was very rare. It only happened at very set periods of time, four periods. Let me review this quickly, uh, and then we'll come look at really what is the first period of the supernatural. The first period is what we have here before us uh, in the Exodus event. Uh, now, remember the date that we have given uh, for the Exodus. The events here are taking place in the middle of the 15th century. Uh, 1445, uh, we have this great event. Well, there was a lot of history. I'm not going to get in uh, at this point uh, as to when creation took place, uh, just except to say this, what you have most likely in your uh, Bible, if you're having Usher's date that says September 12, 404 B.C., probably you should be a little suspicious of that, uh, but whatever. Uh, so I, I don't care really what date we want to assign creation at this point. Uh, but there was a lot of history. All right, there was a lot of history that had taken place uh, from the creation until the middle of the 15th century B.C. Uh, and the miraculous was not taking place. Uh, it is here at the uh, Exodus event when there is a great crisis here uh, whereby God is delivering his people that we have the supernatural. We have the plagues. We have various other things that are taking place that would qualify as the miraculous, as the supernatural. The next time in the uh, Old Testament period that we have the miraculous taking place uh, is in the period of Elijah and Elisha. Uh, and this is now the 9th century. So from the 15th century to the 9th century, uh, there's really no miracles taking place. Oh, an odd thing here or there perhaps, but uh, very, very rare, and for the most part, non-existent until the ninth century. And now when we have Elijah and Elisha uh, in contest with the prophets of Baal, we have a great number of supernatural events uh, that are taking place. Uh, that's the ninth century. Uh, and that's it. All right, that's it. We have uh, no more miracles taking place in the Old Testament until we come now to the time of the Incarnation. The Lord Jesus Christ, obviously, uh, during the years of his Incarnation, performed miracle after miracle. Uh, and in the early uh, apostolic age, uh, we have the apostles that are performing miracles. Uh, and then it ceases. Uh, and it has remained ceased. Uh, and will do so until we come to the final uh, display of the supernatural, and that will take place in the uh, in the future. And again, I don't care what your eschatological views are here. There are going to be two witnesses uh, that, according to Revelation chapter 11, uh, have the ability. And you look at the imagery there in Revelation chapter. Uh, well, let's go ahead and look at this because this is as curious as all get out. I think. Look at Revelation chapter 11. We have these two witnesses that are given power, given authority, uh, to prophesy for this period of time. And again, you can put that uh, in whatever framework that you want to put it in. I'm not going to argue the eschatology. Uh, but I want you to notice the, uh, notice the imagery that uh, John uses here in describing the ministry of these two witnesses. Uh, look at verse 4. Uh, Revelation chapter 11. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now that ought to take you back in your thinking to Zechariah chapter 4. Uh, in Zechariah 4 we have the imagery there, the vision of the lampstand uh, that has the two olive trees on either side with that constant inexhaustible supply of oil uh, to that lamp for the burning. And the whole point of that, according to verse 6 of chapter 4 of Zechariah, uh, is that it's not by might, you know this verse, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And the great point of that vision to which John now is applying 
uh, to these two witnesses is that the work of the kingdom, uh, the work of serving the Lord, of being that light uh, in all that that implies, is in the power of the Spirit of God. Uh, so here are these two witnesses. Is it is not saying that these uh, that that this is a fulfillment of Zechariah four prophecy. That's not what it's saying, but it is saying that just as that lampstand uh, in Zechariah four was functioning under the power of the Spirit of God, uh, so these two witnesses are going to be operating under the power of the Spirit of God as they fulfill their ministry. Uh, verse five speaks of God's protection of them, but verse six. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. All right, now we have two uh, basic areas here uh, in which their prophetic uh, power is uh, described, in which the supernatural, the miracles that they are performing are taking place. They have power to shut heaven, uh, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now plug in what you know about the Old Testament. Who does that sound like? Who do, that's Elijah. All right, that's Elijah. Remember, Elijah appeared on the scene uh, there during the days of Ahab. Said it's not going to rain. Said it's going to rain, and that was the great mark of his prophetic introduction. Uh, well, there are going to be then the spirit of Elijah uh, that is characterized by uh, by these two witnesses, whoever they are. Uh, and the second thing, and they have power uh, over the waters to turn them to blood, to smite the earth with all plagues, often as they will. Now, who does that remind you of? What we're doing here, this is Moses. All right. So just as Elijah uh, and that period, uh, and just as Moses and that period uh, expressed and used the supernatural, so it will be in this end time that these two witnesses uh, are going to have that miraculous uh, super uh, natural ability uh, given by the power of the Spirit of God to perform the miraculous. Now, that's all it's saying. Uh, you have some that want to see these two witnesses uh, as a reincarnation of Elijah, and particularly Elijah, uh, because after all, it's appointed unto men once to die, right? And so God has to bring him back from heaven to, on earth so he can have a chance to die to get, you know, that's uh, boggles my mind, really, why, well, I won't say the word I'm going to say. But I think you know me well enough to know what word I was going to use right there, don't you? Yes. Uh, but whatever. Uh, this is not Elijah. All right. It is not Elijah reincarnate. Uh, it is not Enoch reincarnate because Enoch has to die. All right. Uh, it's not a reincarnation of anyone. And it's not Moses that's going to come back. Uh, this is a very common interpretation. But if you follow the argument, all it's saying is that just as those, uh, just as Zerubbabel in Zechariah chapter 4, ministered in the power of the Spirit, so will these. Just as there uh, was that time of miraculous in the time of Elijah and the Moses, so will uh, it be here. All right, now put all this together. I'm saying there are four times in the history of this old world uh, in which there is the display of the supernatural. The first time with Moses, uh, and then hundreds of years later in the time of Elijah and Elisha, and then hundreds of years later in the time of Christ and the apostles, and now hundreds and thousands, and who knows, years later, uh, will be these two witnesses. The miraculous was not the ordinary. Uh, now, we read it, I say, in the Scripture, and we get the impression that this was just kind of everyday affair. Uh, but it wasn't. It was very odd, and it was very rare that it occurred. But in each of those four periods, when the supernatural occurs, what was going on? It was a time of crisis. All right. It was a time of crisis when there was going to be a contest, if you will, uh, between the one true and living God uh, and pagan religion in the forces of the world and the forces of wickedness and hatred against God. Whenever there was that time of uh, crisis, when it appeared uh, that the very testimony of the one true and living God was in jeopardy, here is the miraculous. We're going to see here in Exodus that there was a contest. Uh, between God and Pharaoh, between God and the gods of Egypt, demonstrating that Jehovah is the one true and living God and that this religion is the one true religion. What happens in Elijah? Uh, we have Jeroboam having introduced the state religion uh, during his day. Uh, now and uh, in the time of Ahab, Jezebel comes on and Baal worship 
uh, is now recognized as an official religion. And here is this contest uh, between the one true and living God, uh, who was the God of Elijah, uh, and now the gods of Baal, and the gods of Jeroboam state religion. All of this contest, but particularly with Baal, and now the supernatural, the miraculous, uh, to demonstrate that Jehovah is the one true and living uh, God. Here is this credible evidence, this unbelievable evidence, as it were, uh, that there is but one true and living God. So we have the supernatural. Well, then, of course, during the incarnation, uh, as the Lord Jesus uh, now comes as the climax uh, of all of God's prophetic word concerning salvation, now to verify and uh, affirm and accredit him as the Savior of the world. Uh, we have the, uh, the, the miraculous uh, taking place. And now during the period of the apostles, to, uh, uh, here's the contest now with Judaism, and here's the contest with Roman religion, and all of the other. It is Christianity that is the one true religion, and the supernatural given uh, the miraculous at that time. Well, of course, when we come to the end time, uh, we were going to see that, and again, figure this out yourself as far as the eschatological implications. Uh, but there is the Antichrist, and there is that great attack against uh, the Christ of heaven and the Christ of God and the one true religion. Uh, a contest that has not yet taken place. And here, then, is the use of the supernatural uh, to confirm and to demonstrate uh, that Christ is uh, the one true Christ. All right, now I'm saying that to put this in proper perspective. When we come to the book of Exodus, we're going to see miracle after miracle after miracle. Uh, but it was limited to this uh, time period. So I hope you understand that the charismatics, you see, one of the arguments of the charismatics, they read their Bible and say, hey, this was commonplace in the Bible, therefore it ought to be. No, no, they're not reading their Bible correctly. Uh, it was not commonplace in the Bible. Uh, it was not commonplace in the history of the world. In epic instances, uh, when there was a time of crisis, uh, God so revealed himself and empowered his servants uh, for the uh, supernatural to take place. All right, so I, I hope that uh, we'll put this in proper perspective. But this is one of the demonstrations, then, uh, of the absolute power and might of God that was required, that was let loose in the deliverance of the people uh, from the furnace of affliction, as Moses calls it. All right, let me show you some of the words here, and I'll define uh, the two key words in question. Uh, I say the first word is the word wonder. Look at uh, chapter, uh, chapter uh, 3 and verse 20. I'm not going to call every word to attention here, but verse 20, And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, uh, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. Uh, chapter 4 is visible to me here. At verse uh, 21, the word occurs again. Uh, and the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return unto Egypt, see that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, uh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, uh, and he will not let uh, my people go. All right, so I'm not going to go through all the references, but as you read, uh, as you read through uh, the text, uh, pay attention to that uh, word wonder. The authorized version translates it here as wonder. Uh, it's the word that elsewhere in the authorized version is translated uh, things too difficult. Right? Remember, for instance, uh, remember was it when Sarah, the Lord, uh, announced to Sarah that she was going to finally have Isaac. Uh, give birth to the promised seed. She laughs. Uh, how can this be? I'm an old lady and whatever, whatever, whatever. And the Lord there says, there is nothing too difficult for me. All right, there's nothing too difficult. That's the same word. Uh, that's the same word that we're occurring here. Now, this word, uh, th this word has reference then to something that is extraordinary, something that is beyond the ordinary, uh, something that is in many ways incomprehensible as far as man's understanding and certainly uh, man's ability to do. Uh, it is beyond human ability. It is beyond human comprehension. It is that which is extraordinary uh, as far as man uh, is concerned. But the point is, God says, while this is extraordinary for you, it is nothing out of the ordinary for me.
You see, it is not too difficult for me. It is not beyond my ability. It is not beyond my power to perform. This is, uh, this is one of the great uh, words then for the supernatural. Uh, I, I'll give you the Hebrew word. All right, this is, this is if you're a soccer fan. I'm not a soccer fan, frankly. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you learn certain names. There was, there's a great soccer player, right? Great soccer player. I don't know if he's still proverbial for the best soccer player that ever was. But is he? You know what I'm talking about? Pele. Pele, right? Some of you know Pele. Uh, Pele. Well, that's basically the Hebrew word, right? Pele. Uh, and so that, that's how, when I was a kid, trying to learn my Hebrew vocabulary, right? When I was a child, trying to learn my Hebrew vocabulary. Uh, I, I wasn't a soccer fan, but I, I, I would hear of Pele being an extraordinary player. You see, so how that worked? Pele, extraordinary Pele, soccer, whatever. Uh, Pele is the Hebrew word. All right, and it designates that which is absolutely beyond human comprehension, beyond human ability, extraordinary, extraordinary. So over and again, all right, over and again, uh, this word occurs, particularly in the context of the plagues. What God is going to do in what we call the ten plagues uh, were wonders. All right, they were extraordinary things uh, that defied human. Uh, imagination uh, and I want and, and human uh, uh, comprehension and human ability to uh, to uh, perform and to manipulate and I want you to keep that in mind what the scripture is saying here uh, that there is I, and I, I've seen on oh uh, on some of these programs on the learning channel and, and whatever various things from t mysteries of the Bible you ever see that thing uh, mis ancient mysteries of the Bible whatever it's called uh, and you, you read that, you, you look at that program, and it, 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 it's interesting, but it's just filled with liberal notions and uh, criticism against the Scripture. Uh, but, but I saw a thing not, not too long ago on, on the plagues, all right, on the plagues. And here, here was some scientist, right, that tried to figure out, you know, here's some kind of red algae or something that comes in a volcano, and, and trying to give a naturalistic explanation uh, to everything that was happening in the plague. Uh, I, I'm not opposed to saying it was natural stuff, but it was an unnatural and a supernatural manipulation of all the affairs uh, of the things of time and circumstance that brought all that to happen. Uh, and, and so don't, you know, don't try to explain the miraculous. Right? This, is, this is the folly. Uh, you, you never want to try to explain the miraculous. Uh, the very point of it is that it is that which defies human explanation. I believe it, but I am not inclined uh, to explain it, whatever the supernatural is. Uh, and, and just keep that in mind, I say, in, in, in various areas of, of concern. We're at the great debate we've been a little bit uh, talking about in, in recent days on, on the Scripture, inspiration and preservation. Inspiration of the Scripture is something that is supernatural. Uh, I am not inclined to explain it. All right? I don't have to explain the mechanics of how God inspired those holy men to write what they wrote. It's supernatural. I believe that he did it. Uh, but I, I, I'm not particularly interested in various theories of inspiration. Uh, those are simply attempts to explain the supernatural. Uh, and that works right on, down, right on down the line. There's the virgin birth. Uh, and that was supernatural. I don't know how it happened. I can't explain the mechanics of it. Uh, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not supposed to, uh, but I believe it. All right. Here is God. These are the Pele's. These are the things that are absolutely extraordinary, uh, that defy human ability to comprehend. And all of the events of the Exodus, uh, where God brought these people out, uh, was a demonstration then of His unique and absolute power. Now we want to keep this in mind. Uh, when we see the primary spiritual application of this in terms of our salvation. This is a picture, I say, of what God does in the salvation of every single sinner. If it took the extraordinary, uh, unique, manifest power of God to bring out the people from the land of Egypt, then just think what it requires uh, for God to save, uh, to save our souls. Uh, and regeneration, that impartation uh, of a life into a dead heart. The New Testament puts that in terms of the supernatural, just as God by his power raised up Christ. So by that same power he has quickened your hearts. Uh, it's a miracle. All right? It's a miracle. Uh, and 
uh, the implications then spiritually are far-reaching. All right, the second word, <coughs> excuse me, is the word sign. It's the word sign. Now, let's stick here in chapter 4. Uh, it occurs here and elsewhere, but I'm looking at verse 8. <coughs> excuse me. And it shall come to pass, uh, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not uh, believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, and so forth and so forth. Uh, see it again at verse 17. Uh, and thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. Uh, verse uh, 28. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Uh, verse 30. And Aaron spake uh, all the uh, words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs uh, in the sight of the people, and the people believed. And again, you just read through this text and you'll see the word sign. Now, the word sign is that banner event, it is a banner event uh, that is used to announce uh, some great truth or to uh, declare that truth, to persuade someone, to convince someone uh, of the truth of that truth. All right? it, something uh, not necessarily, and this is the interesting thing about this word, this word is not necessarily uh, something that is uh, miraculous. Uh, it can be, and very often it is, that which involves a supernatural, miraculous demonstration as a present persuader uh, of truth. Uh, but other times it is just a confirmation uh, that what the Lord has said is true. Uh, I, I view it then in, in those two ways, if I could summarize it maybe like this. It's either a present persuader of truth, and in that context, it is usually something that is supernatural, or it becomes the divine I told you so. All right? The divine I told you so that what I said uh, is going to take place took place. For instance, let me show you, uh, I, I think we can see this in chapter 3. I think it's chapter 3 of Exodus. Okay, uh, Exodus 3.12, it's translated token here, but it's the word I'm talking about. Uh, and he said, verse 12, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a sign unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. All right, now the Lord had been giving and will give to Moses in this context signs that are present persuaders. Uh, put down that stick and it turns to a serpent. Pick it up again, turns to a rod. Uh, well, those were signs, those were present persuaders of truth. But here is the same word uh, that has really nothing miraculous in it necessarily. But the Lord says, you're going to go in, you're going to bring these people out, and when you get back to this mountain, all right, when you get back to this very mountain and you start as a nation worshiping me at this mountain, that will be a sign that everything that I've said is true. Uh, that will be the divine I told you so. I told you that I would bring you out. I told you. And now when you get out and when you come back to this place, this will be a sign, a confirmation to you uh, that everything that I said uh, was true. Uh, let, let me show you, I, I think, the play on this in, in the great uh, virgin passage. Look at Isaiah chapter 7. This word occurs in that context. All right, all this is relevant. I want you to see what the sign is. You know the context here of the great Emmanuel prophecy. Addressed this Wednesday night a couple of weeks ago, the Emmanuel concept. But the situation here is that the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, had entered into an alliance with Syria, and they were going to apparently come down against Judah, the southern kingdom. Ahaz is the king. Uh, and Ahaz is obviously concerned about that threat from the north. And so he makes his plans to enter into an alliance with Assyria. All right, Don't confuse Syria, that's the little nation right north of Israel, and Assyria, uh, that's the one that has Nineveh as its capital right uh, over on the other side of the Tigris, on the west, east side of the Tigris. Uh, different nation. 
All right, so here is a coalition, an alliance between Syria and Israel. And they were going to come down against Judah, Ahaz the king. He gets concerned about this, and so he is making his plans to enter into an alliance with Assyria. Well, Isaiah hears of this and says, don't do that. Don't trust in Assyria. Trust in the Lord here. Uh, and uh, just believe, uh, believe God and everything will be okay. And so in that context, we come then to verse, uh, verse 11. Uh, verse 10, moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Now, the word sign here is the word that we are talking about. And I believe in this context, what the Lord is offering to Ahaz is one of those miraculous, present persuaders. Ask me anything and I'll do it. All right? Ask me and I will do it. I, I, I will give you something supernatural here to convince you to believe in me. Well, Ahaz uh, says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tempt the Lord. Uh, and then... Uh, the prophet comes back at verse 14. Ahaz, rejecting that present persuader, says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Same word. Same word. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, now, here is something that was not going to happen for over 700 years uh, from the time of Ahaz. But nonetheless, uh, the Lord says, this is the sign that I am going to give. Now, you have some people, some interpreters, they get so hung up just on this one aspect of the word sign. They say the word sign is just a present persuader. Something supernatural, something miraculous that is a present persuader. Therefore, how could the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus be a present persuader to Ahaz uh, that would not happen for 700 years? And so, therefore, because of their misunderstanding of the word sign, they say, ah, he's talking about the birth of some kid then uh, that uh, will be the present persuader and then that is typical or something else of, uh, of the coming Christ. you got real problems there. All right? Once you start seeing multiple virgin births, uh, you have something that is tragically a problem. Uh, I, I have no time and I have no sympathy uh, for those who want to see a double fulfillment here, I hear this kind of talk of Isaiah 7.14 all the time. A double fulfillment, one in Isaiah's day and the ultimate fulfillment in the time of Christ. Uh, nonsense. I, it's the politest term I can use here. Uh, no such thing as a double fulfillment of prophecy. There's a single prophecy. Uh, but notice the play. Notice the play. You have to understand, I'm saying, how the word sign is being used. The Lord offered to Ahaz a present persuader. He rejected that. He rejected that. And the Lord says, okay, I'll give to you a sign. Now, we can see this, I think, even in the English. The sign that was offered in verse 11 was given specifically to Ahaz. You can see the word thee there, right? Ask thee a sign. That's singular. Here is something that was being offered directly and specifically to Ahaz that God would give to him personally uh, to convince him of the truth at hand. He rejects that. Verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. That is not singular. All right, that's plural. All right, that's plural. Uh, and in this instance, the offer is not given just to the person of Ahaz himself. He rejected the sign. Right. And God is turning away from Ahaz himself. And now here is a sign that is given to you as a, uh, as a nation, as it were. As a nation, as it were. Uh, going beyond Ahaz. So I, I'm not looking here for a sign that had to be for Ahaz himself personally. He rejected it. Uh, and God now goes beyond Ahaz to give this sign of the virgin birth. Now, I say that the word sign in this context, in verse 14, becomes the divine I told you so. Here is the divine I told you so. That when Emmanuel comes, when this virgin conceives and bears son, the people, and you follow the argument here, the, the nations that you are now so deathly afraid of are going to be nothing. All right, The nations that you are afraid of are going to be nothing when Emmanuel comes. The 
uh, kings that you are afraid of are going to be nothing when Emmanuel comes. In fact, there's not going to be a king even upon your throne when Emmanuel comes. And sure enough, what happens? What happens when Emmanuel comes? Where was Syria and where was Israel? Long gone. Where was the king upon Judah's throne? Long gone. When Emmanuel comes, the land is under captivity, not by these people that, they were, that Ahaz was so deathly afraid of, but they're gone. And Emmanuel, if you will, if I can put it this way, was the divine I told you so that every prophecy uh, is, uh, is true. Now, this isn't a word of judgment. It's in the context of judgment here. We like to take that verse out uh, and use it for Christmas time. And it's a wonderful promise of hope. Don't misunderstand me. But here it was in a message of judgment to Ahaz. Uh, that all of these people that you are afraid of and you yourself are going to be long gone when Emmanuel comes. And Emmanuel comes as the divine I told you so that all of those judgments uh, had taken place. You see. Now that's the idea of the sign. All right, you with me here? I, I don't want to belabor the point, but it's, it's a great word. It's a word that on the one hand is used for a present persuader and then, number two, it is used as a divine confirmation of the truth of what God had already and previously said. In the book of Exodus, uh, we're going to see the word used in both of those senses. Uh, when they came back to Sinai uh, and worshipped God at Sinai, there was the divine, I told you so. I told you. Believe me, this is to add then... Uh, confidence and faith for further dealings. Everything that I said up to this point has been true. You can trust me for the days to come. It's true. But then the present uh, persuaders as well. All right, so the ten plagues. All right, the ten plagues. These certain of the signs to Moses here that you read uh, in chapter 4 uh, about the snake and all of that stuff. Uh, th th those were present persuaders. But then we come to the plagues themselves. Uh, and these were signs of judgment. Uh, that God was bringing against uh, these people. Look at chapter 7 and verse 4. But Pharaoh shall not, uh, Pharaoh shall not hearken uh, unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine enemies and my people, uh, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt uh, and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Here are these plagues, these judgments that are directed against Egypt, are directed against Pharaoh to bring them uh, to the uh, knowledge of God. You can see at verse 3, there's our word signs and wonders occurring there in the context of these judgments. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. These judgments, these plagues that were designed to demonstrate God's absolute power uh, to bring Pharaoh to nothing and to bring the Egyptians uh, to the knowledge of God. And that was a great uh, uh, aspect of this, uh, that they might come to know, that the Israelites might come to know, and that the Egyptians might come to know uh, that God is the one true and living God. There is no God like our God. Chapter 8, verse 10 says that. Uh, Be it according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord, uh, our God. Uh, chapter 9, verse 14. Uh, For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me uh, in all the earth. God is demonstrating through these miracles that he is the one true and living God. That Pharaoh, who thought he was God, was nothing. That all of the gods of the Egyptians were nothing. Uh, chapter 12, verse 12, makes it clear that this was against uh, the gods of the Egyptians. Verse 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses. Uh, verse 12, I want rather. Uh, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. Uh, I am the Lord. All right, displays of power. Displays of power. Here is this context. Uh, Egypt, and again, if you know anything of Egyptian history, their profound uh, theology, their complex theology, gods for everything uh, they had. Uh, and here is uh, now the one true God that is coming to contest, to visible, manifest contest uh, with all of these 
uh, gods of Egypt, and one after the other through these plagues, he demonstrates that he is the supreme God. Uh, that he is the God who has power and authority over this, over that, over the other thing. Not their God that could not do anything to thwart uh, or to hinder uh, the mighty hand of God uh, in the demonstration of his power. And again, you, you look at the, the time of Elijah uh, and go through the miracles of Elijah. I think I've done this with you in the past. Uh, and, and you go through Elijah and Elisha's miracles and you compare that with what Baal theology was. And virtually every... Uh, every, every miracle that Elijah and Elisha performed uh, was a polemic against some tenet of Baal theology. It is God who is the one true and living God. And that was so clearly manifest here at this point. So sign after sign and wonder after wonder, strong arm after strong arm, God revealed uh, all the way through this book in the uh, delivery uh, of the people finally coming uh, finally coming to the Red Sea. Uh, and now with the division of that Red Sea in chapter 14, God took the people through. A sign then that the uh, enemies were absolutely defeated and Israel saw what God had done. Look at the closing verses of chapter 14. This is after all the plagues. This is after the people had now escaped through the Red Sea. Now they have witnessed every demonstration of God's power and signs and wonders. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the land, out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which God did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. These signs and these wonders were something that were visible. They were something that were designed by God to enable these people to see with their physical sight to generate spiritual sight. Uh, and that's exactly what we see happening uh, at this point. They saw, the evidence was clear, the evidence was good, and they then believed. They feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. Great demonstration of power. Now I say you think of the spiritual implications of this. That Red Sea was a uh, great sign of victory. Uh, and the parallels here, and I, I'm only going to be suggestive. Time is gone. Uh, but, but, but you think of the parallels now to the spiritual redemption that we have in Christ. Held in bondage uh, from which we cannot free ourselves. Held in that slavery. Held in that place of no escape. How can, we, how can we be freed? How, where is liberty and freedom going to come? It is only as we have the manifestation of the power of God, the same power, and again, what uh, the New Testament tells us, the same power that uh, God exercised in raising Christ from the dead is the same power that is exercised every time a sinner uh, is saved. It is resurrection power. Uh, and the crossing of the Red Sea in many ways becomes a type of that. Uh, entering in behind, behind is the old life, behind is the bondage, and now crossing through there's nothing but the newness of life and the prospects of uh, that new life uh, with the leading of the Lord. So it's miraculous. The Exodus was a miraculous uh, event. That's one way uh, that God delivered the people. The second thing, and we'll come to this next time we gather together, 